Really into the microphone, and if you will state and spell your name for the court reporter. Um, Ashley Merchant. My first name is A S H L E I G H. My last name is Merchant. M E R C H A N T. Go ahead. I think you are. Good afternoon, Ms. Merchant. How are you? Oh, I'm good. How are you? Good. And, and to clarify, you you are plaintiff or one of the plaintiffs in this case. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And this case was filed on January 30th, 2024. Correct. Um, I'd have to defer to my husband on that. I don't, I, that sounds about right, January. Okay. I know it's late January. Okay. But if it's in, if it's in the record of January 30th, you wouldn't argue with that? I have no reason to dispute that. Okay. And since we were last together at the hearing a few weeks ago, uh, have you received any additional documentation regarding any of the requests at issue here? Yes, we received um, some more NDAs. Okay. And with respect to those NDAs that you've now received, do you believe that that New documentation, new documentation concludes that particular request regarding the NDA? No, I don't. Okay, and what is the basis of your belief that that is uh, not complete? Yeah, so um, I've talked with several people who were employed by the district attorney's office that have signed NDAs. Um, people have reached out to me, um, prior investigators, prior lawyers have reached out to me and said that they signed an NDA and they wanted to talk to me about certain things, but that they had signed NDAs and they wanted to take a look at the NDAs to see if they could talk to me. And I didn't have their NDAs. They weren't part of the group that you gave me. So, and those witnesses didn't have copies either. They said those were copies that had been left at the, at the DA's office. So I know four or five people I've talked to had signed NDAs and I don't have those. So that's why I believe I didn't get all the NDAs. Okay. And were those were those people current or former employees of the district attorney? Former. I think they were all. Yeah, they were all former. Okay. And did they relate to you that those NDAs were signed during the time period encapsulated by that request? Yes. And some of them had actually reached out to me, which is why I originally requested it. So a witness would reach out to me and say, "Hey, I really want to talk to you about something that went on, but I'm worried about this NDA. I don't know what the." punishment is for the NDA. And so that's what that's why I first knew about the NDAs. Um, you know, a witness would say, I really want to chat with you, but I, I don't know what, I don't know if I can be sued under these NDAs. And I didn't know what was in the NDA. Um, and I told him, obviously, I can't give you legal advice, but I should at least be able to see the NDA um, because I believe, based on the one that I had from Mr. Wade, that the only punishment was that they would be um, fired if they spoke with anybody. Um, but you know, that's why I originally asked for the NDAs. I, I, I was surprised that a public agency had um, required something like that to be signed. Okay. So previously we've discussed um, just generally open records requests made by you or your office to, to the county. Would you say that you frequently make uh, open records requests to either the county or the district attorney's office? No, I actually would not say I frequently did. Um, I was surprised Mr. Bonds testified that I had made 40-something. I made, I believe it's 10 to the district attorney. Um, I mean, total maybe, I don't know, less than 20 in total to Fulton County entirely, um, all of the different entities. I made, I believe, 10 to, um, to the DAs, right around 10. Um, a couple of the ones that I made to other groups, like I, I made a request just for example to IT or purchasing and then Dexter Bond went in and closed it out from the DA's office. So I actually didn't make an open records request to the DA's office but somehow in your portal he went in and um, was able to close it out. And so the open records request in the portal would show closed and it would have a letter from Dexter Bond attached to it saying closed to see this letter which I hadn't even made the request to the DA. And so of those approximately 10 requests that you've made, have uh, what's the time frame over which you've made those requests, do you know? A year. About, so in the last year, okay. Um, now, when you make those requests in the past, have you ever had occasion to need to follow up because you felt like you didn't get what you were looking for? Yes. Was that only with the DA's office or other entities? It was primarily kind of? with the DA's office. Okay, and when you've done that in the past, have you ever, uh, how have you handled that previously? Um, so yeah, so out of the open records request, I think the easiest thing is to, to sort of classify ones that related to criminal cases that were pending and then ones that didn't. The ones that are subject to this lawsuit really are ones that relate to no criminal case. Um, 
I had a criminal case that I was doing open records where I was seeking invoices and contracts for um, an independent contractor who was working on that particular case. So I did a series of open records requests to try and find the contracts that were the, um, the contractual authority for that person to be hired, how that person was paid, um, whether or not they had an oath of office, things like that. So those were things I was investigating in regards to that criminal case. Um, most of those requests were um, some were partially filled, let's put it that way, but they were not completely filled. I did have a hearing in that criminal case and I was able to use my subpoena power to get records in that case. That is why those records were not subject to this lawsuit, ultimately. They might have been initially subject to this lawsuit, but ultimately they were not something that was sought because I was able to get those through subpoena. The issue is I, could, I can only subpoena things that are relevant to a hearing that I have and the issues in that hearing. So I, I did open records, let me just kind of back up. I did open records and then I got a hearing. When I got that hearing, I was able to issue subpoenas for those same things that I had been denied in open records. I was able to get them because I could issue a subpoena in that hearing. I could not, however, issue a subpoena for things that weren't relevant to that hearing, which is why this open records lawsuit has continued. But would you say that those things that have been requested pursuant to the requests in this lawsuit are related to the ones in the other criminal case as well? No. They're not in the same line of inquiry? No. Some of them are, but not all of them, no. Okay. Like NDAs weren't, they don't have any relation to that case. Um, I'm trying to think all of mine, the NDAs didn't have any relation to that. Um, forfeiture funds, um, I mean the forfeiture funds had some relation, but it went a lot deeper than that. Um, the rebranding didn't have anything to do with it, no. Okay. You know, when you make open records requests, how do you, from a, from a practical standpoint, how do you do that? Are you using the portal from the DA's website, from the county's website? Does it depend on who you're making the request to? Yeah, no, so it depended on the time. Um, I would go to the entity, so I would go to the DA's office and I would use their landing page and I assumed that IT could track how I was doing it, so I was always very careful to make sure that I did it the proper channels. So I would go to the IT department, I mean, I'd go to, I'm sorry, I'd go to the DA's office and there was a, um, a link on theirs that when you clicked on that for open records, it would take it to the county open records portal. That link was not always active. So there was a time period where I was able to go to the DA's office and file open records request. And then after we filed this lawsuit for a period of time, that link disappeared. So I wasn't actually able to make any open records requests to the DA's office during that period of time. It is now back, um, but I have not since made any since it's back. But I would go to the landing page of the DA's office, click on the open records link for records. It would take me to the county portal and then I have a login and I would type in what my um, open records were request was. Okay. Now, in the past when, you, when you've had issues getting what you felt were a, a full set of responsive documents, um, have you ever had to go further than just following up with the department before? Yes. And what, what, and what did you do in that situation? I filed a complaint with the Attorney General's office. Okay. Did you do that in this case? Yes. Well, I did, I did it, so I'm actually not sure. When you say this case, there's so many different requests that, I mean, I had about 10 requests and some of them were partially filled, some weren't. I filed a, I filed a complaint with the Attorney General. I definitely did that. Um, I don't know which request it would have been listed under, but I know that I did do that. Okay, do you know, so you don't know if, and let me go back to, to sort of reset a little bit. Which, particular request do you believe still have outstanding documents in, in this case? Is it all the ones that you filed on or is it limited to a, a, a couple of those requests? Um, if I could see, if I could look at the actual requests, I can tell you exactly. Is that okay? Is that okay? I mean, I have them. I'm happy to look at them. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, May I go? Yes. yes. easier for you if I mention the couple that, based on what's been testified to that I, and the proceedings it, in this case that I think we're still dealing with? Yeah, that's fine. I'm looking at um, our letter, um, just so you know, the January 24th letter, it just sort of summarized the request. So I was just looking at that to sort of orient myself, but if you want to ask me about a specific request, I'm happy to answer about that. Okay, so 
If I'm not mistaken, I believe the ones that we still have at issue, uh, and based on your testimony earlier, saying that the NDAs yes. were not still complete. We're looking at, um, the there were two requests regarding critical mention, which are um, R00272, 010924, and 675011824. Yes. Do you believe those are still outstanding? or have any documents that are still outstanding? Um, I believe that they were not completely complied with, but I, for the purposes of this litigation, we were not going to be proceeding with those anymore because we didn't have any way to prove that they haven't been complied with fully. Okay, so so for purposes here, we're, we're done with those in terms of production. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're talking about. Yeah, so, so these documents, I... I you asked me my belief. I do not believe that we have received all the critical mention documents. Um, the county spent $20,000 on a contract for this. I do not believe that it received two PDF graphs in exchange for $20,000 and 24 months of a contract for critical mention media monitoring. I have no way of proving that, um, but I find that hard to believe personally, um, that that's what, how, what they got for that money. Because I can't prove that these reports exist, we are not proceeding with anything further in that regard, if that makes sense. I believe so, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, and then we mentioned that the NDAs, which were R000305. Yes, so the NDAs, I've received, I believe, 122 um, to date. I know that there are more that we have not received. Um, and I, based on that, I'm sure there's more. <laughs> but. Do I know if there's more? I... And, and you described having some conversations with, with former employees. Um, is there anything else that leads you to that belief, or is it, or is it just based on those conversations? Well, um, the first thing that led me to that belief was the fact that um, the, fir the first issue I had was so Dex Dexter Bond, the open records custodian, had done a business record certificate in a civil case where he certified Nathan Wade's NDA. Then he did a business record certificate in our case where he certified that there were no NDAs. So I had two certifications where he swore to two completely different things. Based on that, I do not have any faith that they actually have been searched for. And then the last one that I, I think may still be at issue, I want to be clear, is the list of attorneys that have been hired during uh, Madam D.A. Willis's tenure. Yes. And that was uh, request 000198-010824. Is that, is yes. that one still? That is, that is still outstanding, yes. Okay. And so with respect to these still outstanding requests, did you send these requests to the district attorney's office or to the county, do you, do you recall? Um, I can tell you. Let's see, I'll tell you exactly who I sent them to. Um, the personnel records, the list with the dates of hiring, that was sent um, through the public records portal, but the department I was requesting records from, there's a drop-down box when you go online, and the drop-down box I did was district attorney. So I've got that um, for that one. And then, let's see, I can tell you the next one. Um, well, critical mention, I, I don't think you asked me about that. Um, Also did um, hum I did it to human resources. Um, I did one to human resources. Let's see. Hold on. So the um, the one that I did regarding um, promotional material. I submitted that request to purchasing. So that's one of the ones I'm glad you asked me about it. That's a, actually a good example. So I submitted that request to purchasing, but somehow it got hijacked by the DA's office and the DA's office closed it out with a letter from Dexter Bond. So I actually submitted that request to purchasing, um, but the DA's office responded. And I'm guessing it's because I asked for records in there um, 
for from the DA's office. Um, but I did not submit that to the DA's office. I submitted that to purchasing. And do you know if any of these were ones that you submitted to the to the excuse me, to the Attorney General's office for a com uh, for a complaint? I don't. Um, that wasn't part of this litigation, so I didn't really pay that much attention to it. I can tell you that. I can find it. Um, the one that I submitted. There was only one, and I don't know which one it was. And, and maybe a better question might be, how did you make a determination regarding what requests to send to the Attorney General's office versus what requests to go go to litigation more directly on? Um, it depended on the time frame, mostly. So, and also the AG didn't really work. I mean, it, I've done open records for many years. John and I have both done open records. We've gotten, I mean, it's something lawyers do. Every lawyer needs to know how to do open records. And normally if an agency um, was not responding appropriately, I could file a complaint with the attorney general and they would call and say, hey, follow the law and it would be resolved pretty quickly. Um, that was by far my preferred option because I certainly don't want to spend the time or money having to litigate. Um, I tried that early on in this case and it didn't help. So I didn't need to beat my head against the wall. Yeah, but, there, but there were still some that you did not go to the Attorney General's office about. You just went straight straight to litigation after having some discussions with it with the, the department themselves? I only filed a complaint once with the attorney general, and I think it was a generalized, hey, Fulton County's not paying attention to open records requests. Um, please help. And they did not. Okay. Now, with respect to the requests you sent to the DA's office, did you ever uh, speak to or have any correspondence with uh, Madam DA Willis herself regarding this? No. Do you have any reason to believe or any evidence that uh, Madam DA was involved in the actual response to the open records request that you submitted? Oh, she's copied on emails. I mean, there's there's emails that she's copied on, and then she received, um, yeah, I mean, she received the lawsuit. She received the letter about the open records. I mean, did I personally speak with her? No. Okay, and did, did you ever see her actively take any involvement in, in re response to the open records? Did she say, hey, I'm, I'm trying to pull this, but she never, or did she ever correspond with you at all? No, she did not. Okay, all right. So, Considering that, that Madam DA did not take in, in any part that you were aware of in terms of actively responding to the request, can you shed a little light on why she was named as a defendant in this, in this action, either in her individual or official capacity? She's the elected DA. It's her office. Okay. And then with respect to her as the elected DA, do you believe her to be the person responsible in the department for complying with open record, to providing responses to open records acts? I think, I think that every government agency has a duty to respond to open records requests. I think when you have an elected official, that, that they're the ones that are actually held accountable by the public. And so they are the one that sets the policy. Are you familiar with the custodian of records for the district attorney's office? I have since, in this litigation, learned that I guess it's Dexter Bond now. And is there a reason that during this litigation, when you learned that it was Mr. Bond, who was the custodian of records, that that, um, that the amended complaints continued to name uh, Madam DA herself? Because she's the DA. He's not. I mean, he could be fired and not there to, tomorrow. She designates him as the open records custodian. That's her job. He's just an employee. She's allowed to designate whoever she wants, but that can change at any given time. I mean, county employees can come and go. When you have an identified custodian of records, is there a reason why you would would choose a, a different person than that to name as the, the respondent? No, but I, that would be something that John would do anyway. I mean, he's the one that does the civil aviation, not me. And if I could just interject here, right? <laughs> um, the Fulton County District Attorney's Office was the original defendant. And the county took the position that that was not an entity capable of being sued. That's right. And then affirmatively stated that, I guess, if they're subject to the Open Records Act, it would be the district attorney in her official capacity. And I've already dismissed the district attorney in her individual capacity, uh, although I, I understand the, the reason that it was named in that manner was a belt and suspender sort of approach. But um, I don't know that asking Ms. Merchant why she named the Fulton County District Attorney in her official capacity um, really 
advances the ball because they did so at essentially my urging based on the county, uh, the county and the district attorney's office's position that that was not an entity capable of being sued. So. Okay, I'll move on with my question. Thank it's on you. Your Thank you. All right, Ms. Merchant, uh, you were here and heard Mr. Bond's testimony and I did. examined him. Yes. So during his testimony, there was quite a bit of discussion regarding the, the critical mention documentation. Um, I just want to confirm with you that you made the second critical mention open records request because you felt the response to the first request was not complete. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And do you recall what you believe was missing at that point in time and, and why? Yes. What was that? Um, so the first one was what I would call a compilation of documents. It was 44 pages. It was clearly cut and pasted. Um, someone had removed dates, times, parties, subject matter, things like that. So someone had to actively take those documents and redact them. And it, it I mean, from the, the cutouts, it looked like they literally cut and pasted them. Um, there were things that were not part of it. I mean, you would see, you know, part of an email and then you'd have no to from, no date, nothing like that. And then you'd have another part, and then you'd have a link that didn't actually have a hyperlink. So I could tell that the whole emails were not contained. I could tell that there were significant parts of the emails that were missing. I also could see on the subject matter, when you have a, um, when you have an email, there's a subject matter. And below it, if you have an attachment, you see a list for an attachment, where there would be a JPEG, a PNG, a TIFF file, a PDF, something like that. Um, there's a link. Well, when I received those documents, I saw the name of the link, the name of the PDF, or the name of the JPEG, whatever that was, um, one time it was a PowerPoint. I saw that as an attachment, but that attachment wasn't provided. So someone had printed off a document that clearly showed there was an attachment, but they had not given me the attachment. So I thought I was super clear when I wrote back and said, hey, I want the attachments to these documents. And I tried as hard as I could to highlight exactly where they were, named the document, named where the attachment was, named what the attachment you know, actually was called, um, so that someone, whoever printed those emails out, could go and actually click on the attachment and give me the copy of the attachment. Okay. Now, being that you, you believe that there was some, some missing documentation, did you include all of the missing documentation you believe existed? Was that in your follow-up request? Yes. All of that was in your follow-up request? My follow-up request was very specific as to the um, documents that were missing, the PowerPoint, I mean, yes. In that second request, I can just read a portion of that for, for you. Um, Which request number is it so I can follow along? Yes. Uh, R00272. 270. 010924. Okay. And it said, uh, I asked for the analytics and documents that are clearly referenced. Um, and I'll skip a little bit saying, in monitoring the reports with analysts provided to the DA's office monthly, um, appears the emails may have been accessed on a regular basis, may all have accessed these on a regular basis, and names a number of, of individuals, and those are public and paid for. Does that encompass all of those items that you just listed off? So I'm looking at a different one than you are. Um, I'm looking, you had said 010924. In that one, I say, I'm seeking a copy of any and all correspondence, and I put including copies of all contracts and or payments and all analytics and or reports to and or from. Um, okay. So yeah, I mean, I, thought, I think analytics um, and reports are clear. Um, and then contracts and payments are clear. So that's that case number. Um, but then I also followed up with another one, um, and this one I was even more clear. Um, I referenced the prior one, I said I got a set of emails, and then I said I asked for the analytics and documents that are clearly referenced and attached to those emails. Um, I put that reports with analytics were provided. It appears the emails, and I put the names that I could find from those, Jeff DeSantis, Fonnie Willis, Jeremy Murray, Pallavi Perkasta, Ryan Bryant, and Rita Kepler. Um, and that the reports, yeah, that they're public documents. I thought that was pretty clear. All right. All right, I'll move on a little bit here to um, the, the subpoenas that were issued in, during the course of this litigation. Yes. Um, were those all sent to 
employees of the district attorney's office, or were they uh, sent to people from different entities as well? There were there were multiple um, different different places that I sent them. Um, so I had subpoenas to third party vendors. Um, I subpoenaed Critical Mention, which, for example, had I not subpoenaed them, I would have never known about. Um, because I still haven't to this day received copies of the payments for the second year of the contract. Critical mention was a, a two-year contract. The first 12 months was paid through purchasing. Um, so I received the county documents from purchasing about that showing I had the contract and I had the actual payment. The second year I asked and asked and asked and I've never received it once from the county still to this day. Um, I received it from critical mention. So I did were that. There, were there others besides critical mention, um, individuals that were employed in other agencies or, or other or other certain at least departments of the county. Yes, there were other departments of the county. So okay. I sent, yeah, I sent them to critical mention. Um, I sent to IT. I sent to. I think one of the ladies used to work for the, Fonnie Willis, and now she works for a different department. I sent it to them too. So when you're subpoenaing individuals who do not work for the district attorney with respect to documents that are that you believe are in the possession of the district attorney's office, mm -hmm. how are those individuals supposed to know if the district if the district attorney has those? items and do you believe I guess let me start with that question first which question how do you believe or why do you believe that those individuals who are not a part of the district attorney's office would have access to or possession of requested documentation that you requested from the district attorney's office well, they did actually have it. That's how I got most of it. Um, so I don't know how. So that, that's the they, problem. They had possession of district attorney materials. Yeah, IT did. That's where I got all the emails from. So IT apparently did. Um, and you have to understand when I don't work for Fulton County. So when I do an open records request, I don't know how their systems work. I don't know how things are stored. I don't know things like that. So I know that there are documents. I know that there is a, for just for example, there is a PowerPoint attached to an email that has its only DA employees on that email. I know that PowerPoint exists. Do I know how the county stores it? No. And I have learned that I have to ask for it every different way I can possibly ask for it in order to avoid someone saying no records exist. So I asked for it from the DA's office. They did not give it to me. I asked for it from IT. IT all of a sudden is able to access all of those. So apparently IT can go into the DA's emails. I did not know that, but I'm glad I subpoenaed them because I learned it. Okay. Do you believe any of the individuals who do not work for the DA's office, um, at this point we'll say other than IT because you've explained that, but any of the individuals who don't work for the DA could produce, could produce documents on behalf of the district attorney responsive to your request? I don't know. You'd have to ask me. You'd have to be more specific who you're talking about. Was there anybody that you subpoenaed that you believe could produce documents on behalf of the district attorney's office other than individuals who work for the district attorney's office. Okay, I think I understand what you're asking. So I didn't care if they were produced on behalf of the district attorney's office. I just wanted the documents. So when I've just, for example, subpoenaed ITs, obviously they're not producing them on behalf of the DA. They're producing them on, the ha on behalf of IT. I really don't care who produces them. I just wanted the documents. So yeah, critical mention supplied documents. They were not supplied on behalf of the DA, but they were DA documents. That just because somebody who has dealt with the DA's office has documents that those documents are also held or belong to the district attorney's office? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're asking me. If critical mention is producing documents, how are you, how can you be sure that those documents are also in the possession of the district attorney's office? Because the law requires that the district attorney comply with the Records Retention Act. And so, for example, to answer your question, critical mention was paid with a check out of the district attorney's fund. It says, the check says DA Willis for Fulton County. Um, the law requires the DA's office maintain copies of all of that. It's, and so I would assume that when I asked for that document, since the law requires that they maintain that document, that they would provide it to me. Have you filed in this case any, are there any claims in this case regarding record retention or is it just open records? I, I, so an open records act litigation is not going to involve a violation of the records retention act, but 
if I, so when I go, when I'm asking for a document in open records, one of the things that I want to know is does the document exist? Does it have to exist? Because I've learned one of the answers that I get, particularly from the DA's office in Fulton County, is no responsive records. So I have to go look at the records retention because they say no responsive records. Well, they've taken a position that we don't maintain any records essentially, so we don't have to give you anything. But the law actually does say that they have to maintain certain records. So I go and look at that. Before, I'm not going to ask for something that I don't know that they're that, required to keep. Is that a position that they've taken in, in that, that's been taken in this case that that the district attorney isn't required to? Never mind, I'll, I'll, I'll withdraw that question. But based on the response, I, I, I want to go back a little bit to your understanding of: Do you agree that the DA's office? And the county themselves are are separate entities. Yes. Okay. And so, even if a different department has documentation, that doesn't mean that the, the district attorney's office necessarily has that documentation. Would you agree with Depending that? Depending on the documentation, yes. Yeah. And so, even if the people who you subpoenaed in this case that work for other departments had that documentation, it doesn't necessarily mean that the district attorney's office has that documentation. In this case, it did, because when I subpoenaed those entities from the district attorney, I also received the same set of documents. So clearly, they did have it. Okay. Now, with respect to how the, how the case came about, you had mentioned you didn't go to the, to the DA's office, or excuse me, to the Attorney General's office this time like you did in, in, in a different, on a different issue. Okay. Could you, could you explain again why why that would have been the case, why you didn't attempt to pursue the, the Attorney General's office route again? So we have different remedies when the Open Records Act is not being complied with. One of them is to file a complaint with the Attorney General. Um, there are some agencies that the Attorney General is very quick to call and help with. In fact, I think the first time I met you, I filed a complaint with the Attorney General in East Point because they were not providing any documents. The Attorney General called you, you were the city attorney at the time, and you said, oh my gosh, you're right, and I got the documents. Um, I've learned that municipal courts um, respond very quickly to the Attorney General. I've learned that the Fulton County DA's office does not really care when they get a call from the Attorney General. So I could have wasted time and spent a cent requests over and over to the Attorney General in this case, but that would have just been a waste of time. Okay. And, and in your consideration, did, did the fact that the, the Attorney General also is not quite as high, high profile or high publicity as something like filing a lawsuit against the District Attorney's Office? Your Honor, objection. I'm not sure what the purpose of that question is other than to make a political point. Sustained. You can try again or rephrase. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, we discussed previously that you had made some other open rec records requests and there were subpoenas involved with, with another case that you're handling, a, a fairly high profile criminal, criminal matter um, involving prosecution by the district attorney's office. Um, was it your intent to include some of these documents in that litigation as well if they showed what you wanted or what you thought they might? Yeah, well, I think the only way to answer that question is to look at the timeline. So I did a series of open records requests in September of 2023. Um, it's, it's fair to say that most of those were related to that criminal litigation. At the same time, though, I actually, um, I was, I, I became the president of the Georgia Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers in January. We were actually working with some other public interest um, organizations prior to my taking over as president. We were doing some investigation on the jail conditions and on the backlog funding for the jail. Um, most of the records that are subject to this lawsuit actually had to do with the public interest work I was doing on tracking funding for backlog and the jail issues. So there were two separate real like um, umbrellas, you know, that I was working under. I was looking for things in regards to the criminal case, but I was also looking for things that had absolutely nothing to do with the criminal case. Mr. Bowman, can I ask a, a question? Your line of questioning right now seems to be going towards um, the intent that the plaintiffs had in seeking the records or the use to which they intended to put those records. And 
I'm not aware of that being a relevant factor for the court's consideration. If there, if that is, then please tell me why I should be considering that. But my understanding is essentially, is it a public record? And was it properly requested in a way that was understandable and could have been complied with? And, and Your Honor, I, I think maybe um, this goes more towards less the actual production of the documents and more towards the attorney's fees issue. So, so this I, will, I will withdraw. I'll, et I'll, yeah, I'll hold off on some of these questions okay. until we, we get to the attorney's okay, fees portion. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mr. Bowman. All right. Um, if you give me just a minute, Your Honor, let me make sure that that's exhausted my my questions on the substantive portion. Um, okay. Um, a couple points that uh, I would like to go back to um, regarding the, the documentation that you, you did end up receiving from, from IT related to emails. Mm -hmm. um, because you've named the district attorney's office and, and the district attorney's office is who's, who's still at issue in this case, um, if they did not have those documents, you, you said you received them from IT, correct? I received them from, well, I received them from you. So you all, actually Ms. Monroe, I received them from Ms. Monroe. They did not send them to me directly. Ms. Monroe sent them to me. She sent them to me from IT, um, Fonnie Willis, Dexter Bond, Kevin Armstrong. Um, I'm trying to remember everybody. There were four or five different people. She sent them to me as the certified records in response to our subpoenas for all of those folks. And there was someone else, maybe Jeremy Murray. And was, was that certification of those records, did, do you know, did that come from the from the district attorney's office or from the IT department? It, it came from, so whoever, Ms. Monroe, it came from Ms. Monroe, but she sent it, like, if it was the IT packet, it came from IT. Like, the, whoever was in charge of IT certified that. They did the business record certificate. Um, and, and, and being that, if, if IT ha is the, the entity that provided those documents, would would you agree that that's, that's not relevant to the to what the DA had in their office if they are documents that the IT department has? Well, they're the same documents that you provided me from the DA's office also. So you provided them to me from Fonnie Willis, Dexter Bond, Kevin Armstrong, all of those people. So I basically, it was like 197 pages and I got the exact same set of documents. I don't know where you all got them from. You, can go, you could have gotten them from IT, you could have gotten them from the DA, I have no idea where you got them from. But I was, the same set was certified from each different agency or each different person, but it was one set of documents. I have no idea where you guys got them from. In your archive, could we have just a moment? Sure. All right, thank you.
Paul, I apologize. Um, with respect to with respect to the um, the NDAs, you believe are still outstanding, and the individuals you spoke with. Um, do you know, or could you provide the names of those individuals, or? the individuals that you believe have NDAs that are still outstanding, and if you can't, you, if you can't recite it now to be able to provide it to us. I can, I'm, like I told you before, I'm happy to provide it to you, but the witnesses that told me that don't want the district attorney to know who they are. So, I mean, if, if the court wants me to provide it, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm not hiding it at all, but those people have asked me not to they don't want the district attorney to know that, so. I guess at this point, though, if we're, we would have got, we would ask for them because if, if, they're, if they're at issue in the case, we, we would need to know who they are so that we can check if those documents actually exist. Right. And those are the people that have told me that they signed NDAs, which you all did not provide me the NDAs. So they're the only ones I know. But, I mean, you provided 122, and there's a lot of DAs that aren't in there. So I don't know if they were picked pick and choose, I mean, who signs NDAs, who doesn't, I have no idea. <clears throat> right. All right, so just if, if we can have those. And then I think the rest of the questions I had, we'll so, save for the rest of the, uh, for the attorney's fees portion. So the names of those individuals, to my way of thinking, would be relevant to two issues. Number one is whether or not their NDAs have been provided for purposes of any injunctive relief that the plaintiffs are seeking. I don't think that their names need to be disclosed in open court for that purpose. The second reason that it might be relevant would be the extent to which there's any way to identify or understand if the fact that those five, four or five, you know, persons NDAs were not produced is somehow indicative of uh, a, a, a failure to produce others that might be in the possession of the DA's office. I also am not sure, particularly given that they're former employees, if that would be relevant in open court either. But if you feel strongly, I could be persuaded, Mr. Bowman. No, Your Honor, we're, we're happy to take them off, off the record uh, so that we're not putting people's names out in open court. That's fine, We just so we can confirm whether or not those documents do exist. Okay, thank you. I'm happy to provide them. Okay, thank you. With that, I believe that's all I have for, the, for this portion. We'll, we'll come back to a few more questions. Okay, understanding that you're reserving your right to question yes. her on other matters. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Martin, questions for this witness? <laughs> No, no further questions for this witness on this issue, Judge. Uh, while she's on the stand, though, if Your Honor is uh, inclined, I can question her about damages now, or we can wait and wait for Your Honor's ruling on the liability issues. Um, but we don't have any additional evidence but for damages. Okay. Um, I think that just for efficiency's sake, it would just make the most sense to go ahead and have you question Ms. Merchant regarding the issue of damages. Uh, and outstanding issues if there's any injunctive relief other than the NDAs. And yes, Your Honor, I think, I think the issues with injunctive relief, to tackle that issue first, I think the ones that we set forth in the email to you, um, those, those are still the current issues okay. it, and framed in that manner as well. Uh, I'm not aware of anything else. Uh, Ms. Merch has testified, obviously, to some things that she thinks um, probably are incomplete and has evidence of that. But as we sit here today, there's no way for us to tell you how to, how to tell them to do it, Okay. Um, which I know puts you in a tough spot. As an aside, um, the Supreme Court has said that one of its forthcoming opinions tomorrow will oh. be the Gonzalez versus Miller case. Of course. May I approach? Your yes, sir. Mr. Merch, have any of you a uh, copy of pre-marked plaintiff's exhibit uh, number, four, number 24? Can you uh, you recognize it? Yes, this what is it? my um, record of time, description of work performed. It's a Word document that I kept with an outline of my time that I had to spend on this litigation. Okay, is this a true and accurate copy of the time record that you prepared in the case? Yes. Are all the time entries listed on this document for the uh, civil action case number 24CV001325? 
Yes, and the open records that before the action number came about. Okay, and can you tell the court how you prepared this document? Yeah, I just keep um, sort of keep track as I'm going. Um, you know, keep an open like Word document. I really was trained. Um, I used to do work for the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals as an appointed lawyer, and um, this is how they like them to be done. They like their times kept like this. Um, I used to have a judge who appointed me fun cases, and so I'd have to learn how to keep my time for that. Um, and so we keep them in um, increments, time increments, point ten, a tenth of an hour um, increments, and so it's just tracking what I did on the case. Okay, what, what is, before I ask you that, um, Your Honor, at this time, plan if we move into evidence, plan to exhibit number 24. Mr. Baum? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit 24 is admitted. Uh, Ms. Merchant, uh, can you t uh, tell the court um, the total number of uh, fees and hours that you had in this case prior to today? Um, so this document is as of September 30th. I had 78, 78 hours, 78.7 hours, and then attorney's fees. So attorney's fees, um, you know, to be fair to the county, um, definitely significantly reduced um, my normal average rate um, and looked more towards what the attorney general pays for this type of litigation. Um, and so my total attorney's fees as of September 30th were $23,610. Okay, can you tell the court how you arrived at the $300 figure based on the review of the attorney general's website? Yes, so I went to the attorney general's website. Um, there's there's a couple entities that hire outside counsel um, to do work in civil cases, and one of them is the Attorney General. They publish every single year, they publish, um, they're very transparent with their rates that they pay lawyers, and they're very transparent with how much money these lawyers bill. So they actually publish it online. You don't even have to do an open records request. You can just go online and click it, and it shows it. And so I reviewed all of those, and lawyers that have been practicing approximately the same amount of time that I've been practicing, um, I used those, those rates. How would your private rate uh, for um, your services uh, be different if you uh, had not used the Attorney General's website? Oh, it would be far higher than um, $300 an hour. I mean, I've, I've been practicing 21 years and, um, you know, do highly specialized work. I mean, I would charge at least $600 an hour. Got me approach? Yes. Yes, Mr. Merchant, I can't hear you. Um, he showed me what is marked as plaintiff's exhibit 29. It is an affidavit that I prepared that has a very um, brief outline of my um, my past work and the, the yeah. About, yeah. Sorry. Is, it, is it true and accurate copy of the affidavit you yourself prepared? Yes, it is. Okay, Your Honor, at this time, plaintiff, we move into evidence. Plaintiff's exhibit 29. Yes. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Exhibit 29 is admitted. And did you say it's like a CV or? A... Yeah, okay. An affidavit, thank you. So, Ms. Merchant, can you explain to the court a little bit uh, more about your experience um, as a lawyer? Sure. Um, so, I went to the University of Florida, Levin College of Law. I graduated in 2003. Um, I came to Atlanta and I worked at the Southern Center for Human Rights. Um, I actually did some civil litigation with them and I did um, death penalty defense work in Georgia and Alabama. Um, prior to coming to Atlanta, I worked for a criminal defense lawyer in, um, in Florida. And then when I moved to Atlanta, I worked at the Southern Center. When I was admitted to the bar here, it was I was sworn in June of 2004 in this courthouse. Um, Judge Baxter swore me in, and I worked at the Metro Conflict Defender at the time. Um, that was prior to the Indigent Defense Act, so the Metro Conflict Defender actually had the contract for state court work. Um, so I was a public defender downstairs in state court here, and then I left that job to take a job at the Office of the Public Defender, which had the felony contract. Um, so I moved to do felonies, and I did um, I was in the complex trial division at the public defender here when it was Vernon Pitts, and then I moved to the appellate division. And then I left that, um, I had my first daughter, and left 
the public defender to open my own law firm. Um, I first opened it, I had two, I had one in Buckhead and I was um, in office with some other lawyers and then I had an office in Cobb County. And I have been, since 2008, I've been in private practice, um, 95% I would say is criminal defense litigation, 5% um, is civil. Um, it's usually things like this where I have to get involved somehow or my expertise as a criminal litigator somehow comes in handy. So can you tell the court a little bit uh, about whether you've been recognized in your field practice? Yes, I have. I've um, received a number of honors. Um, I am the current, like I mentioned earlier, I'm the current president of the Georgia Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, which is kind of a long track. So I've been on the executive board for five years. Um, I have received, I've been a super lawyer for over a decade. Um, I'm old enough to be super lawyer, not rising star. But before I was 40, I was a rising star. Um, I have received on the rise award from the um, daily report, um, received a year ago an honor from the Southern Center for Human Rights um, with you about our work in a civil um, civil action case that we had a very a very large plaintiff's case, um, you know, doing doing public interest type work, but have definitely received um, received the Cobb Bar Award for um, Champion of Justice, received Gactel's Award for Champion of Justice. So I've been been very blessed. And the, the work you performed in this case, can you explain to the court how you and I divided up the labor in the case? Oh, yeah, that's easy. I, I do the facts. Um, so you, John does all the civil um, stuff, and I, I do mostly the facts. So anytime there were like a factual basis that needed to be written, that would be my job, um, determining all the facts and keeping records of all the facts and keeping all the documents clear. The actual, um, the legal drafting we would do together to a certain extent, but you would do the primary legal drafting, and then I would just assist in it. Jeremy approach? Yes. Merchant, I'm handing you what I did to see Marcus Plaintiff's exhibit in the form of three Yes. Mr. Merchant, I can't hear you when you're walking back to this I, I, podium. I, I asked her, uh, I'm handing you what I previously marked as Plaintiff's exhibit number 23. Do you recognize it? And she said yes. Yes. What is it? This is um, this is our expenses. The first couple pages are um, import, in, input into a program we use called Clio, and then it's um, all receipts from all of our expenses in this case. Um, is it a true and accurate copy of our expense report for this case? Yes. You know, at this time, plaintiff would move into evidence plaintiff's exhibit number 23. Mr. Bowen? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit 23 is admitted. Um, can you tell the court what our total expenses in this case are prior to today? $1,339.23. And to be clear, uh, are you the one that put the entries in the dock? No, my paralegal did. Um, have we had discussions with Ms. Bergdorf about that? Yes, we have. And you're clear from that document that these all relate to this particular case? Yes, I am. Ms. Merchant, uh, when you sent all the requests, um, whether it be to the county, to the DA's office, uh, in any shape or form, did you do so in good faith? Yes. Okay. And when you and I filed this complaint, did you do so in good faith? Yes. That's all I have, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Mr. Bowman? Merchant, um, so when, when in this case, um, who is your attorney in this case? John um, and myself. I mean, I'm an attorney, so you know, it's okay. myself and John. We're a small firm. So you are representing yourselves effectively. Yes, I'm well, one of them, but John does the majority of the litigation in civil cases. Okay. And then, a little bit of an odd question to ask, given circumstances, but is, do you have an engagement agreement? Uh, with the firm regarding this case? Um, I don't think so, but John would know. <laughs> Your, Your Honor, we'll stipulate that we, <laughs> I don't, we did not hire him. I was going to say, I don't think so. Okay. With that said, how did, was there anything other than what you already discussed about how you determined the rate that would be applied for, for services in this case? Um, like, why a certain rate? Yeah, how did you settle on the, the $300 figure? Mm -hmm. um, because it's a public agency, because this is the county. I mean, it's... It's 
reasonable for the county. I mean, I've done, I don't currently, but I've done, historically, I've done plenty of um, appointed work and I always have a reduced rate for that. Like I do it for the federal government, um, for the for the 11th Circuit, and it's always at a reduced rate, so. So essentially your, your rate for government work? Definitely. Um, now has anybody, uh, other than the, than you and Mr. Merchant, have you, has anybody else been reviewing the time spent in this case to determine the reasonable amount of time? Reviewing our time, is that what you asked? Yes. No. Okay. Is there anyone else working to control the costs or direct the litigation in this in this matter? No. Okay. Um, did the the potential we let me back up? We've seen a number of orders entered in in the case regarding cameras in the courtroom and and, and media related to to this case. Um, have you coordinated with any media entity at all regarding? Uh, this case or the hearings in this case? I haven't coordinated. I will say that if someone calls me, my policy is always if someone calls me and asks me for a document that's a public record that's already on file with the clerk, if some news agency calls and asks me for something, if it's already a public record, I have no problem sharing that. Have you, have you reached out directly to uh, any media organization or reporter or other individual to um, proactively reached out to them to discuss this case? That I've reached, like I've initiated the contact? Yes, ma'am. I wouldn't say I've initiated any. I mean, there are reporters that I talk to that I'm friends with that have asked me about the status, but I don't think the one I'm thinking of, I don't actually think ever reported on this case. Is there any other, without, of course, without revealing the substance of any such conversation, um, have, you dis have you discussed this case with any other uh, attorney, other counsel uh, on the criminal matter that's related uh, to some of the issues here? There's more than one criminal matter, I think, that, that could be related. I have told some of the other lawyers about the status of this case, if that's what you're asking. Okay, have you discussed any strategy with the, any other counsel? Uh, no, not strategy. Okay. Any, anything about the, the, the factual underpinnings of the case? with the other counsel? The facts of the case, I have definitely, I mean, John and I are lawyers, like we talk to lawyers, so yeah, I, I definitely have talked to other lawyers about the facts of the case. Okay, are any of those lawyers uh, representing co-defendants in, in the case when, in which you represent um, Mr. Roman? I have told lawyers in the Roman case about some of the facts in regards to open records. Uh, and again, without really any client, attorney client, Substance. Uh, have you spoken with Mr. Roman about this case? Yeah, but not really at any great length. Well, because this case, so when you talk about this case. Oh, hold on. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Let, 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 me, <laughs> let, let me interject here for a moment. Let me say this. I understand certainly that part of the DA's position, uh, the, district, the, the defendants, the district attorney's office and Madam DA in her official capacity, is that perhaps these requests were not substantially justified because they were intended to for use in the prosecution um, uh, for uh, of Michael Roman, right? I, I absolutely understand that. Um, I, I don't know that it, it it's an efficient use of our time to sort of beat that horse because I certainly understand that that's the position um, uh, of the DA's office. And, and Your Honor, the, the reason that I would I I bring it up is number one, uh, counsel uh, opened the door to, with discussion about good faith and the good faith activity in, in the case. Um, I, I think it goes a little bit too, too good faith when you're, we're talking about the level of publicity that, that somewhat this case, but certainly the other case, have, have generated and the interest in um, the goings on at the DA's office in particular, um, and as well as the, the, the um, sort of some, of, some of the expansion and all the subpoenas, specifically including the, the subpoena to Madam DA herself in this case, I do think it goes to the reasonableness of that and then therefore the reasonableness of the attorney's fees. Okay, fair enough. Mr. Merchant, your response? Yeah, I didn't know. Uh, Mr. Merchant, if you could sit down and be on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a slow learner. <laughs> My wife can tell you that. Uh, well, I did open the door to uh, attorney-client waiver. 
Uh, and he specifically asked her, what did you talk to Mr. Roman about? She is his counsel in a separate case, so he cannot inquire as to communication she had with her own client, even even if it's marginally relevant, which I don't think that it is. Well, there are a number of, of privileges that would attach in terms of attorney-client work product, et cetera. Um, but, uh, I mean, I think the point's been made. And, and to the extent you wish to inquire further, I'm not saying you can't. I just think, I'm just letting you know, I get your point about that aspect. And, and I just note, Your Honor, I didn't ask about specific conversations, just whether she had spoken with Mr. Roman. Fair but enough. Go ahead. With that said, I'll, I'll continue on. Um, has there been anybody else outside of uh, you and the members of your firm, Mr. Merchant, who have, um, who have provided any input or funding at all into this case? No, haven't gotten a dime. Okay. Um, do you have any any agreements or, or discussions with any outside parties regarding anything that, um, regarding the proceedings in this case? No. Okay. Um, has any of the work in this case been billed to clients in the, in Mr. Roman's case? No. Okay. Have they, have any of the documentation that you've received in this case been utilized in that case? No. In this litigation now? In, in this, the subject of this litigation. Right. I want to make sure you weren't saying in response to any open records. No. Because no. early on, so when we filed it, just, just to qualify, just to make sure that it's perfectly clear, when we filed this litigation in January, there were a number of outstanding open records requests that were also part of this litigation originally. Those I was able to subpoena those documents when I had a hearing in the Roman request in the Roman case, and some of those specifically were things like invoices, things like that. So I asked for those under open records. I didn't get all those, so they were initially part of this litigation. But then when I got a hearing date in the Roman matter, I was able to subpoena those, and so I was actually able to get those, so they didn't have to stay part of this open records. Thank you. I do want to go back to Exhibit 24 in this case, um, which was the uh, the description of the work performed. Mm -hmm. um, now we talked about this case having been filed in uh, late January of, of 2024, and I'm looking at page one of Plaintiff's Exhibit 24, and I'm seeing entries that begin in September, uh, going up through uh, onto page two, going to. Um, all the way up through prior to filing the complaint in this case. Are, is it your your contention that the the uh, correspondence and, and the issues that were dealt with prior to the filing of this case is something that should be included in attorney's fees? Yes, because it was all part of what I had to do to get responses to the open records. If you look at, at page one um, and you know what you're referencing on the, the second page, page two, so how it's supposed to work is I'm supposed to file an open records, ask for the document, and then you all give me the document. When it doesn't happen that way and I have to follow up and email and beg and plead and explain again and again for months, that's all part of what is leading up to the litigation. And that's what you'll see on the first page. Follow up on email, follow up on ORA response, send another email. Um, Oh, and you actually, okay, so to answer, I'm glad, I'm glad this is in front of me now. I can qualify my answer earlier. The complaint to the Attorney General was in October, um, you know, October 17th. So I filed this lawsuit in January. I mean, these issues were still outstanding. Um, so clearly the Attorney General complaint wasn't going to fix things. Um, but no, all of these are part of pre-suit, pre I guess, work is what you could talk about. Um, and let's just be clear. if they had been complied with over this six months, there would never have been a litigation. But like uh, November 29th, send an email following up with the county regarding- I, mean, I, I have a nasty question at this point, so I appreciate the, that. But, um, if you could give me just one second, Your Honor, just make sure that I've hit everything.
that's all I have at this point, Your Honor. Uh, I would reserve it just in case there's any redirect. Thank you, Mr. Bowen. Mr. Merchant? Yes, just, I just have one question. Uh, so, Ms. Merchant, if you, we had had to hire outside counsel and they had to read all the correspondence that you had sent to the county and to the DA's office and got up to speed, done all the legal research and all of that, and we paid them their rate, would it have been more expensive for us to do that or less expensive than handling outside? Way more expensive. Right. Cost prohibitive. That's all I have. Then. Okay. I have a couple of questions just to make sure I know what the exhibits are that I'm looking at. Um, I heard Exhibit 23 being identified as a document supporting claimed expenses of $1,339.23? That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. Um, and then separately, Exhibit 24, which some questions, I mean, I, I've seen that it is a table with individual entries uh, of time. What I was less clear on is, is this as to all time expended by the merchant law firm or is it just as to Ashley Merchant? This is my time. Okay. This is my time. Okay. Thank you. And then do you want them? Yes, please. Thanks. Thank you. Hmm? Anything, was that the only question you had? Anything else, Mr. Bowman? No, Your Honor. Okay. Ms. Merchant? No. Okay. Yeah, that was all I had. Okay. You may be excused. Oh, thanks.